Welcome everyone to the key population oral abstract session on people who use drugs. Um, our first presenter today, I'm so sorry, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jessica Proger. I'm from Western University and I'll be your session moderator for today. If you can please put any questions you have at any time in the question text box, I will monitor those and bring them up um, at the end of the presentation. So you don't even have to remember your question through the whole talk. Um, and our first presenter today will be Dr. Rosalind baltzer Turgi, who's the Senior Director of the Clinical Programs Dr. Peter Center. And she's going to be presenting an abstract entitled A Roadmap for Implementing Injectable Opioid Therapy, Opioid Agonist Therapy, Learnings from a Three-Year Pilot Project. Thank you, Jessica. Everybody, hopefully everybody can hear me and getting hopefully get a thumbs up. My name is Rosalind and I, as, she, as Jessica said, I'm the director responsible for the clinical programs at the Dr. Peter Center and who I have with me is Damon Hassan, who is the lead uh, nurse for the IO program here, as well as Courtney Pankratz in the background, who is our KTE lead for this project and has also um, been instrumental in terms of putting this abstract together. So first off, you know, we would like to do our land acknowledgement that we are doing this work, the work that we're doing here and where we gather today for Damon, myself and Courtney is located on the traditional and ancestral and city territory, the Coast Salish people. So our introduction, and I'm gonna have to be creative and move some out of this way here, uh, is that we are one of the few community agencies that have been able to uh, implement an IOP program. And we have found some key considerations for community agencies that do this. Uh, and again, we're talking about a, a program that is community-based. Uh, and we have tracked some uh, learnings as well. Just a reminder for those who don't know, the Dr. Peter Center was located in Vancouver, uh, is uh, specifically for people with HIV. It has, we've been in operation for over 25 years, providing care and support. Uh, and our, we are focused on people with HIV, but also with other health and social challenges. So we look to ways to engage people in their health care. We have a day health program. We have a licensed care facility. We have supported housing. In all our services throughout the years, we have certainly a core um, model that we use but our services are always shifting in terms of what the needs and particularly the risks of our clients are. So hence we started IOT and just for those, I, obviously the, not many will know that IOT is the injectable opiate agonist treatment that provides medically supervised and pharm pharmaceutical grade opiates for injection. Uh, what we are involved in here for IOT is uh, hydromorphone and dicetylmorphine. We all know the evidence, this is well-based and historical. It's the cost to society, which was uh, certainly um, very clear from the Salome, uh, Salome study that was done uh, in Vancouver here. And we know in terms of the criminal activity has reduced as well. We also know that it's a very effective treatment in terms of, for many people, uh, in terms of their illicit drug use and particularly with the cost of toxic lives that we have been seeing. So actually, Dr. Peter Center has been trying to get, had tried to get the up and running an IOP program for probably three to four years before uh, we were able to get funding for it, not because we weren't seen as important, but because the, in terms of health funding, in terms of provincial funding, which was very supportive in the regional funding, it was supportive of these kind of programs in BC. Uh, it, it just was trying to divert funds in terms of where it was most needed. We, but we were successful when we applied for Health Canada's a Substance Use and Addiction Program, and we were funded through that since 2019 for a three-year project, which gave actually not only operational money, but also for the, uh, knowledge, for the evaluation uh, component of it and the knowledge translation component of it as well. So we're very fortunate in getting that funding. Uh, as we all know, the you know it, it is the opioid therapy and which IO is part of 
is a promising treatment option for people who use drugs, and we know that, and particularly knowing about some of the toxic treats why. We also know that during the past couple of years with the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic as well, we saw that unprecedented number of accidental drug toxicity deaths. We know that people were isolated, they were alone, there was other things going on, uh, which we understood as well, differences in money, and it became quite a challenge in terms of keeping people in a program as well. So our model emphasizes the collaboration holistic approach to health care. Everything we do at the Dr. Peter Center is, is looking at how to engage people in their health care. For our IELTS program, we were very fortunate because we had some other models that we could look at, particularly through cross-channel through Provident Healthcare. And we had the, uh, and I apologize, we have an error here, the BC Center for Substance Well, we, they have guidelines which we're able to follow. Uh, we are already patient-centered care and that is part of the guidelines. We provided an integrated service so people are can access other services because we know that um, we felt that we would be successful in our IO program because we offer an array of services which people can come in and take part in and they can stay for the day as well, which adds to that in terms of their IO. Um, and we use a community pharmacy. Our hours of operation for our IO program are 8 o'clock in the morning to 5.30 at night. There's a core time between 9 and 4.30 when we actually provide the injections. It is two injections and then a takeaway as well, uh, either a takeaway or an actually administration of oral dose. Um, and uh, we don't, we aren't strict on timings because we do want to engage people in their health care as well. So those are some of the basic things within our program, which are probably different than others. We originally had the funding for being able to go up to put 20 people at 25 maximum. Uh, on the right hand side is a little schematic in terms of how we did our room. We had to fit it in just like everybody else. We had to try to fit rooms in and we had to design it in a way to be able to fit. So we have five people at a time that we can provide for, uh, three during COVID. Um, and we um, had designed it in terms of, this is where Damon came in. He actually looked at the room and looked at how do you engage people? And he'll talk about that more in the lessons learned as, as well. The, um, we are the first community agency to start dicetyl morphine, which has its own challenges. And we had continued funding after research. We, were, uh, we showed that we could do this. We were an important part of the region and now we have regional funding. The researchers, the preliminary research, and we had a, they had a low end and this actually was uh, partly we could do to COVID is that uh, we just we did lose some people with challenges of engaging and keeping people into the program. Uh, CERB was not our friend during COVID, during during trying to do um, either opiate agonist therapy programs or IO. And our whole program, we never stopped having our center open all through through COVID. And so it, we did try everything. But what the researchers did find out in terms of their preliminary surveys was that people did, they reported that they reduced and stopped having opiate, opiate overdoses, that they reduced their use of illicit opiates, that they decreased their use of stimulants, and they reduced their use of other, other substances as well. They reported having an improved physical health and mental health, and they uh, agreed strongly that they'd not be at risk of an overdose while on OIO, which are these are important factors. One thing anecdotally we know is that it engaged them in their healthcare here because we all also are, because of our premise here, we look at, at ARV adherence and other healthcare adherence as well. So we know that that went up anecdotally as well. Our lessons learned for this, um, those opportunities for funding, you always got to be out there looking. We are a nonprofit charitable organization. We're a standalone agency. We're not part of a health region in the sense that we're not a uh, regional service uh, funded in that way. So we had to be creative and we encourage people to look creatively for those. We know that the lesson learned also in terms of the IO prescriber shortages, it's not, oh, this is a, this is a specialty. And it's a very intensive time, labor intensive kind of program for the prescriber. You have to have them available. They have to be quite dedicated. 
officially very labor intensive to subscribe. Once the program has been set up, it is a labor subscriber, probably 90% less initially a lot of subscribers. There is that on call aspect of it as well, because we, we it's not burdensome in terms of our community program for the prescriber. However, in terms of prescriber shortages, we also look at it, the physicians and the physicians, your core in terms of like it's any recruiting with any kind of specialty of just a small core that you can recruit from as well. We have been very fortunate. We've had physicians and consultants that are actually, we have Dr. Cheryl McDermott, who is our primary prescriber and our consultant. The other challenge for us was the coverage to the pharmaceutical drugs. In a hospital programs, the, the pharmaceuticals are covered differently in a community. You do have to pay for them. We were, we were funded within our grant to have the hydromorphone funded and the dicetylmorphone funded. Dicetyl, uh, but it really is. Now that they're approved for IO, this is really open access. However, we all know that Hydromorphone and dicetylmorphine is only two of the options that also we're looking at now. Uh, Sufentanil, uh, Ventura, we're looking at, and of course you're also looking at other ways of, of augmenting, because you do have oat augmentation as well, for example, fentanyl patches, which are not IO, but they're part of. So you really got to, you're really looking at an array of pharmaceutical drugs, and you have to look at the access, the coverage, because of and why they're used. So for the prescriber, there is some really winding around, but we've been quite creative in some of our ways here. Um, which gets us into the next thing, navigating the complex regulatory requirements between the pharmacy, nursing, physician, prescriber, regulatory requirements. It has been quite the challenge, and you don't want to miss, make a misstep because you're dealing with narcotics, you don't want it. We don't want any of us have programs that lose their way um, with this. Particularly the pharmacy has some specific ones, and this is where you're going to find in terms of community pharmacy and hospital pharmacy, it's quite, it can be different in terms of some of the regulatory environment requirements. For example, one of the things that came into hiccup that in that impacted all programs across, whether it be hospital-based or whether it be community-based, was the aspect of having carries. You're always, again, looking for how do you engage people? How do they go on with their life? And to have to be able to have that opportunity to have carry syringes. However, you always have to have a pharmacist to give this. There are some things that are regulated. So that's an example of a regulation that a nurse could not do. So, you know, things like that. So you really need to, to know. There's also a lot of documentation, and that's very important when you have your partnership with your local pharmacy. They have to know how much time and effort is going to be done with this. As Damon pointed out, once you're past titration, you're on a maintenance dose. It's a bit simpler. But your pharmacy has, they have not only to make sure things are labeled and back and forth. They have a lot of documentation to do on their on their end, so they have to be trained specifically as well. And from a nursing perspective, there's and pharmacy perspective, there's a very tight controls in terms of how you do your prescribing and how you manage missed doses and things like that. So you do have to make sure that you're in this partnership. It, it cannot be where one piece is um, thinking, well, I can do all this. You've really got to work with prescriber, pharmacy, and, and nursing, and client, because the client's got to be in there and be, be right on track with this. The effect of ongoing training is important, and the client engagement in the healthcare, and I thought I'd give um, Damon just two minutes to just to reflect on that as well. We found it in our environment because we were offering, it, uh, we, we're working in, in a, whether it could be other um, agencies in the sense that some people are, are involved in a mental health uh, team or they, they are getting uh, ARV medications. We find this program. Um, we have a, a lot of success with people that are, weren't having success in other programs based on the fact that we can offer a multitude of services at the same place. We are getting people back on their ARV medication. Uh, Amazing rates compared to what they were before. Often, um, it's individuals with schizophrenia that might have an issue just with uh, being paranoid about an environment. But when we 
We offer um, just more time to get established within the program. We're not um, as regulated when somebody has five minutes, you know, before they find a vein, then they would have to IM. We have a little more time, especially initially, to um, basically uh, offer a sort of counseling with the um, the uh, I/O experience, the I/O that was at that time, and find that very helpful to them as well. Um, What we have found, just like Damon has said, that it's an effective treatment option. It reduces that risk of overdose and HIV transmission. It engages them in their health come. Um, and we did see, we did see that those risks that, it, that the COVID brought into play as well. So I'd like to, um, for more information, please feel free to contact myself or particularly Damon um, and Courtney. I think we'll have her information up there as well when she did the original slides. So we're open to questions now. I'm not quite sure where we are in time. <laughs> Thank you very much for that excellent talk. We're a little bit over on time. So um, I think what might be the best strategy is to keep the questions as um, I'm seeing quite a few questions coming up in the chat, but to hold them until the end. And then hopefully we can um, revisit this if that's, if that's okay for you. Yes. Great, thank you. That, um, thank you for presenting that. A very impressive program. Our next speaker today is going to be um, Adrian Guta, um, who's an associate professor at the University of Windsor, and they are going to be presenting the abstract entitled, We're Able to Start Addressing Untreated HIV and HCV, How Healthcare Providers Affiliated with Safer Opioid Supply Programs Describe the Implications for Harm Reduction and HIV-HCV Care. Dr. Guta? Uh, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, um, all right. Uh, hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you for uh, coming to the session. Um, Okay, so I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to declare, although um, I, I do mention uh, a few uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, drug names, but uh, they haven't sponsored the talk uh, or anything. And I'm going to try to stick very close to uh, the 10 minutes. Um, just want to uh, acknowledge uh, the uh, traditional uh, lands that uh, I live uh, and work on. And, um, you know, I know that uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure, are uh, familiar um, with uh, the opioid uh, toxicity uh, crisis that uh, we are all uh, living through um, with unregulated fentanyl and fentanyl uh, analogs as the major uh, drivers and also increasingly uh, benzos. And um, in uh, 2019, uh, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs uh, put forth uh, this concept paper, um, you know, to uh, consider a safe supply um, as a, as an option, as a as a path uh, to move forward, um, and um, you know, a safe supply referring to legal and uh, regulated uh, supply of mind and body uh, altering uh, drugs, and so not maintenance therapy though. And um, um, around the same time, um, you know, uh, uh, clinicians um, and some allied researchers uh, were uh, also coming forward to say, yes, we need to be doing this. And uh, it was a sort of very exciting moment. And uh, then of course, uh, COVID-19 hit and uh, really exasperated uh, uh, the situation. Um, and, uh, you know, in response then to you now these dual uh, epidemics, um, Health Canada, um, you know, as a, as a federal, uh, sort of federally sanctioned uh, uh, response, um, approved um, safer supply. Um, and uh, it's interesting to sort of see the, the shift in language from safe to safer as we go from a kind of community uh, model to a more medicalized uh, model. And so uh, safer supply refers uh, to providing prescribed medications as a safer alternative to the toxic uh, illegal uh, drug supply to people who are at very high risk uh, of overdose. And 
we saw a $25 million initial investment uh, through uh, the Substance Use and Addictions uh, Program, and that has continued uh, to evolve. And uh, the project that I'm presenting today um, was originally kind of conceptualized in, in 2019. Um, uh, some of the folks in, in that photo uh, are involved uh, in the project. And, and then we've kind of continued to follow through uh, throughout the pandemic. But initially, uh, we applied to the Ontario HIV Treatment Network to explore what uh, was kind of understood at the time as emergency uh, safe supply program. We weren't sure if you know, if any of this kind of mobilizing uh, at the community level and um, between um, prescribers would, would continue, but uh, it, it has through Health Canada. And we were interested in kind of implementation questions, trying to understand who's doing this and how are they doing it and, and what does it look like in practice? Um, questions around like titration and, um, um, you know, and wraparound supports and stuff like that. Um, uh, we explored the kind of consolidated framework for implementation research, and um, we interviewed uh, 27 uh, providers, uh, physicians, nurses, allied uh, health workers, and pharmacists. We had um, you know, a good gender representation um, and in terms of, uh, of ethnicity uh, as well. And, um, and, and this was uh, across our four um, uh, safer opioid supply partner sites uh, in Ontario, and we're doing a thematic analysis. And uh, yes, we absolutely did interview uh, clients. Um, and I'm, I'm not presenting on that today, but uh, I want to let you know we have, and uh, about 53 clients as well, and then hopefully uh, uh, we'll be in a position to present that maybe uh, next year. Um, coding for that is, is underway. And so in terms of what we heard, uh, in terms of the Ontario model, kind of recognizing that this is being done differently in, in other parts of the country, um, programs were primarily kind of, uh, embedded in primary care, uh, delivered through community health centers, and typically off-label prescriptions for kind of daily uh, oral cadian, so slow-release morphine, and then take-home uh, dilaudid uh, hydromorphone. And the, uh, the Cadian we heard sort of uh, being observed and then uh, the Dilaudid uh, taken home and, and used um, you know, as preferred. And there was considerable variation within and, and across programs. And of course, because um, we sort of delayed data collection, uh, the programs evolved to respond to, uh, evolved to respond to the pandemic uh, as well in terms of prescribing at, um, you know, at, at some of the, uh, uh, the COVID isolation centers and, and things like that. Um, there was a lot of talk about sort of getting in and, um, and you know, getting into the programs and, and getting on uh, safer supply. Um, There's a lot of talk about the transformative uh, potential. Um, you know, uh, very, very powerful accounts from prescribers like, you know, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe that it was the answer to the opioid epidemic and all the harm and tragedy associated with it. Um, very powerful stories of folks who had been um, sort of uh, disengaged uh, or pushed out of the healthcare system sometimes for years, decades, and coming back in um, through safe supply. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but it was a sea of need, just um, phones ringing off the hook uh, in some cases in terms of the intake lines. And, and to manage that, uh, a lot of the programs, um, uh, I should say a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we heard from four programs. Um, of, of the four, there was a lot of discussion about the need to then prioritize um, individuals with an established history of, of overdose and unmanaged uh, HIV and or uh, HCV. Um, women, especially who might be pregnant, uh, sexual and gender diverse folks, and Black, Indigenous, and, uh, and people of color. Um, and just this quote, so anybody that is urgent, so um, you know, we mean urgent would be pregnant, uncontrolled HIV, and, and sex trade involved. I'm sorry, the first quote was from a nurse practitioner, and then the second from an allied health provider. And we heard about a lot of folks with um, HIV or HCV kind of being referred in. Uh, so in um, this quote here, um, 
that we've had a, a, quite a few referrals from the hospital-based uh, HIV team of people who are taking no therapy, or we probably had at least uh, five from the hospital team that had CD4 as zero and were imminently going to die. And so the docs reached out to us. And we, we heard uh, quite a few stories about that, folks who um, had not been tested, um, had no engagement uh, with the healthcare system, uh, they had been tested, um, they were not uh, on treatment. And, and then once referred, then uh, this provided an opportunity uh, in some cases within teams or within uh, clinics to refer them um, uh, to uh, uh, HIV or uh, HCV um, uh, infectious disease uh, docs who are affiliated. So, um, you know, so almost every intake I do, an individual is hep C positive, if not HIV positive. And at the time of intake, I do an immediate referral if they identify that they want treatment. I do an immediate referral to the hep C team. And, and so they connect with the client. Um, and then, and Safe, uh, Safer Supply was talked about as an engagement kind of strategy or, or mechanism. And, and providers spoke very positively about the potential to engage people uh, living with HIV uh, and or HCV in this way. And, um, oh, isn't coming up. Ah. and I thought it was really interesting the way that engagement is, was framed and especially in this quote here. So when I say engagement tool, what I mean by that is we're giving patients something that's actually useful and wanted in their life, right? And when they experience us supporting them on their own terms of their own identified needs, that brings them back into healthcare in other ways. And they go on to say, and, and also most of them are like, please have me swallow my ARVs at the pharmacy, right? Uh, they wanna be on therapy, uh, but they need that cue, they need their help, and they need that reason to go to the pharmacy and actually get it. So the idea being, somebody needs to be well enough, so not in withdrawal, to be able um, you know, to engage in sort of uh, like health-seeking behaviors, to be able to, you know, to get out of bed, to be able to go to the pharmacy. And there was a lot of discussion about increased access to harm reduction supplies uh, and reduced injection use and engagement in sort of like survival uh, sex work. And then improve testing, treatment, and engagement and care. And, and often this is framed as um, something as simple as having the pharmacy put everything together in blister packs so that somebody could go in and, and take uh, all their medication uh, at, at the same time if, uh, if that's what they wanted. And, and, and choice was really emphasized in these interviews, right? If somebody is ready for that, if somebody wants that, we can arrange that, uh, set that up. And, and we're starting to think now at this point, this is still very early uh, in terms of analysis about kind of what a safer supply informed kind of cascade model uh, might look like. And, you know, the folks that we talked to really wanted to highlight uh, the ability to kind of, um, you know, to measure uh, change, measure success. Um, for clients who uh, were living with uh, HIV or HCV. So let's quote here. So obviously uh, there's objective measures. Uh, so we see people having their viral load suppressed, their CD4 is going up. We can see that safe supply is allowing them uh, to engage in HIV treatment. And we have actual firm markers of what that success looks like. So physical health, basic stuff. I've seen people gain weight, uh, uh, menstrual cycles coming back. Uh, having time and money and, and, and food and you know, the ability to, uh, to eat it. And, you know, in thinking about uh, this model, you know, we often focus on kind of testing uh, as, as that first moment, but really thinking about the work needed to get someone to the point where they're willing to talk to, um, you know, if not a physician, uh, maybe an outreach worker to kind of consider uh, engaging in, in care to, you know, to consider eventually maybe uh, getting tested. Um, and the roles, the role of substances as, as supportive uh, in each step along the way as facilitating uh, people's ability to, to engage. Um, and the role of safer supply programs and kind of trauma-informed approaches that really came through in, in all of these interviews, um, discussions around, um, you know, medical violence, uh, structural violence, uh, the need to address that, the need to work uh, differently. 
um, you know, programs that are um, you know, reaching out to some of the most marginalized folks in uh, Canadian society have to be uh, organized differently. And, you know, uh, in terms of how all of this fits into larger kind of goals and, and maybe rethinking those goals, rethinking some of those uh, metrics, but so we have, you know, um, again, a prescriber talking about 96%, you know, uh, of their uh, clients being virally suppressed, 92% uh, kind of actively engaged in, uh, in hep C treatment, 97% um, kind of no longer engaged in, in survival uh, sex work. And sex work came up quite a bit. Um, I, I don't think there was kind of an anti-sex work sentiment, but recognizing that for some, um, or if not many uh, of, the, uh, of the clients, um, you know, wanting to have options um, not wanting to necessarily be, de be dependent on uh, sex work uh, you know, to manage uh, their substance use or, and, and access. And just some challenges. So a uh, need for more options. Uh, prescription fentanyl uh, came up uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, simply Dilaudid is not cutting it. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of clients uh, do need to um, kind of uh, supplement uh, uh, their safe, uh, safer supply uh, with uh, unregulated uh, drugs, and especially during the titration uh, period. I uh, need to expand the reach uh, uh, you know, and, and the resources to support all of this um, and need for community-led uh, responses, that, um, you know, for example, buyers club. And uh, you know, a number of participants said that they would be happy to uh, still participate in that, that they would be very happy to uh, hand uh, safer supply kind of, uh, not hand, but um, you know, recognizing community leadership uh, in this and to, uh, to participate as needed, maybe uh, coming in once a week or you know, again, or as needed for clinical uh, support. And again, uh, the safe supply programs having uh, important implications for HIV and uh, HCV. Uh, from kind of very initial contact uh, you know, to long-term uh, engagement and care, um, need for the expansion of safer supply to meet the need, including for prevention purposes. Uh, PrEP didn't come up uh, a lot uh, in these interviews, but I think that's something that we might want to explore uh, further. And um, this idea of, of, of uh, uh, safer supply is an engagement mechanism. I, I think it's something we need to uh, think through uh, as well. Um, I, I don't think we want to have a situation in which um, someone's engagement in, in you know, HIV care um, is, is tied to uh, access, but um, you know, I think that's something that we want to discuss. And then um, need for future research, just recognizing that uh, so much has changed uh, in the last uh, two years. Um, and that uh, you know new programs are emerging, like through infectious disease clinics, and we're also doing some of that work. And I uh, just want to uh, thank the larger team, and again the Ontario uh, HIV Treatment Network. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, um, Dr. Gouda. I think again, in the, just in the interest of time, we'll hold questions um, on this talk on presentation number two until the end of the session. Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Michael Silverman, who's the chair of infectious diseases at Western University. The title of his abstract is Sustainability of Benefit of a Comprehensive Community Program to Prevent HIV Among People Who Inject Drugs in London, Ontario. Thanks, thanks very much, Jessica. So I'm gonna talk um, about uh, the, our management of a, a recent HIV epidemic, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of multiple people uh, in, in London, both in uh, academic centers and in uh, community institutions. Um, so historically, London had a low incidence of HIV. So in green is the incidence per um, 100,000 people in London, and in red is the Ontario-wide incidence, um, excluding London. And you can see that before 2010, London was a low incidence area. Between 2010 and uh, 2013, we, we unfortunately became an uh, average incidence. 
And then in 2014, something started to happen where we began to rise and we rose to where we were two and a half times the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the provincial incidents. Um, and we wanted to know what was going on and how we could stop this. So what was going on in 2014 and 2013? Well, most of our epidemic was among people who inject drugs. That was the vast majority of new, new diagnoses. And the main, uh, back in 2010, the main drug that was being injected, that was being injected locally was um, OxyContin, uh, um, a long-acting act, uh, long preparation. There was some prescription, and this is overall prescribing um, uh, in Ontario. So this is uh, Ontario-wide data, but in, uh, in London, we know most was OxyContin. And then in 2012, there was an effort to um, decrease OxyContin prescribing because it was re realized that this was a, a common drug that, uh, that, that got people unfortunately addicted. And, and, and then became injecting and began injecting. And so there was a switch to oxyneo, which was a preparation that was supposed to be more difficult to tamper with and more difficult to crush and inject. And, and oxycontin uh, was, uh, prescribing dropped dramatically and was switched to oxyneo, but in red is hydromorphone content. And what actually happened was rather that a lot of people, although there was some switch to oxycontin, there was a lot of switch completely out of, uh, um, the, the, the product line into hydromorph content. And hydromorphone um, became the dominant drug injected, and especially hydromorphone content with the dominant drug injected, uh, particularly in London. This was also seen in some other areas like Thunder Bay and Niagara, but in London, it was particularly heavy. So how do you inject hydromorphone content? This is a long acting preparation. We spent a lot of time talking to people because we were, be, we, we were bewildered why we would get an epidemic of HIV associated with injection drug use when we had such a large um, um, uh, unused uh, injection prep, uh, preparation and, and, and unused needle and syringe distribution program. Per capita, we have the largest program in, in, in Canada and even in absolute numbers, the second largest after Vancouver, which has a much larger population. So, um, you know, over 3 million uh, unused needles were being distributed on the, on, on the streets, and yet we were having an HIV epidemic, which didn't make sense. So we talked to people, and um, in, the, the, the way they inject was you, you open up the capsule, you pour in the beads, and they can be put into a pill crusher. Some people use, you know, some, some, uh, lipstick containers, anything hard to cr crush, the, crush these long-acting beads, and then you pour it into a cooker. You add a filter um, and water, water to dissolve it, and the filter because it stays in a slurry and it's very hard to pull up. And so you need to stick the needle in a filter to draw it up, and then um, and then you can inject. But a lot of the drug remains behind, and our study showed that 45% um, of the active drug remains behind. Page, uh, patients would tell us they knew that because they do a second wash; they add more water and suck it up and draw more, draw and inject more, and often. People would do six, eight, eight, eight cycles of this, and often because the drug is quite expensive, they would often share washes. Someone would do the first wash, and then the second wash. It was sixty dollars a capsule, and so many people would 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 take turns on the washes. So how could that transmit HIV? Because people would say they very rarely share needles or syringes. Well, if you if you put a needle and syringe in there and you you suck up the drug, you inject yourself. People don't, don't tend to share needles and syringes, but they say, well, it's only been in me, I can use it again. So they then uh, add more water, do another, do another wash, and then stick the needle in off and use the needle tip just to mix up the slurry a little bit. And now, unfortunately, that needle's been in the arm and the tip has been in and, 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 the, uh, and, and uh, uh, has now back in the filter and now that tip that's been contaminated has been in the drug. Then they inject themselves and say, okay, someone else, you can take the next wash. Now, unfortunately, there's some HIV on, on the filter. Next person uh, uh, suck, uh, draws up the, 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 uh, the mixture and injects themselves and could transmit HIV. But you would think that HIV would not survive on this. I mean, HIV does not survive well on surfaces. It does not survive well just in sterile water. But we looked at this and the the drug excipients, the stuff that makes it long-acting, include ethyl cellulose, 
hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, and microcrystalline cellulose. Microcrystalline cellulose particularly got caught our, our eye because that's actually in viral transport media. That's something that stabilizes viral envelope and makes viruses live longer. And could this be keeping the virus alive in the mixture? It also has um, gelatin in it, which is a protein and iron oxide, which and those things along with the sugar could keep bacteria alive. And indeed, uh, for another day, we could talk about how this helps keep Staph aureus alive and helps lead to endocarditis. But so we looked at, is it really keeping the virus alive? And this was uh, in partnership with uh, Dr. Eric Arts and, um, and Colin Venner in his lab at the time. And the, we, we, we took this, the, the mixture and actually spiked the mixture, the, the, the slurry in the, in the cooker with, 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 a, with, with live virus and then um, aspirated it just like you would if you were mixing, uh, uh, if, if you were about to inject and then injected it onto, uh, onto lymphocyte, lymphocyte cell line and see if the virus actually stays alive. And if you, if you had hydromorph controlled release, hydromorph content in there, at five minutes, a lot of the virus still remained alive, much less if it was dilated, the immediate release hydromorphone that doesn't have those, uh, those cellulose mixtures or the iron. Um, um, and, um, and microcrystalline cellulose does keep the virus alive, not as well as the hydromorph controlled release, probably because it's got multiple cellulose components and, st and sterile water kept it alive a little bit for five minutes, but by one hour, the virus is dead unless you still have hydromorph content. And at four hours, the virus is still alive unless if, if you got hydromorph content, but other things, the virus has died. So it does keep it alive in there. Is it, is it actually leading to transmission within the patients? So we did a case controlled trial um, uh, where we, had, we, we interviewed 35 patients who were HIV positive who injected drugs and 84 HIV negative people who inject drugs. And um, we compared um, patients, and this is the logistic regression. Um, and if, if you shared injection drug preparation equipment, that is the cookers and the filters, uh, and you also shared needles and syringes, then you were 20, almost 24 times more likely to be HIV positive and strongly significant. What if you didn't share the needles and syringes? Um, which a lot of people didn't so, so share because they were so widely available, but did share just the cookers and the filters. Well, then you were 22 times, almost the same, 22 times more likely to be HIV positive than someone who doesn't share anything. If you only share the needles and syringes, there was no more, you were no more likely, but, that's, but most people who only shared needles and syringes did it extremely rarely because there were so many available. And so that's probably why this didn't show to be significant because they only did it very rarely in certain circumstances with someone they knew quite well. But sharing injection drug preparation equipment, they did commonly, it was almost the rule. And people would say that they often did that five or six, four or five times a day. If you were MSM, if you're a man who had sex with men, were you, how, how, you were 11 times more likely to have HIV than if, than if, if, if you were not. And I note that Sharing just the cookers and filters was twice as strong a risk factor as being MSM for, have, for having HIV. Having unstable housing was not um, a, a risk factor. But we thought, well, what can we do about this? Just telling people don't share the, don't share the, don't, don't share is not going to happen because the drug is too expensive and, and people were sharing the money to be able to buy it. And, and uh, so, and telling people to throw out the washes, uh, it, it, it's too much. People are not going to be willing to do that. And we talked to people. What if we just heated it with a cigarette lighter? So if we heated the cooker just for a few, for five to ten seconds until it bubbles, um, and then we found that when we did that and do the same experiment, the amount of virus dropped by two log by ninety nine percent. Both when we do a first wash and we do it if you heat it after the second wash, either time, whenever you do it, it drops at about ninety nine percent. So it could potentially prevent transmission. So we started an intervention in the community. In July 2017, an educational campaign for physicians to get, to get them say, saying, if to, to encourage them, if you're going to prescribe to someone, particularly for safe supply, do not use long acting hydromorphone content. Use immediate release preparations like dilated, but avoid the long acting preparations. And then also um, the Cook Your Wash campaign, uh, we started where we distributed cigarette lighters uh, with unused gear through harm reduction program. Now, I want to emphasize that this was not the only thing that was happening to try to control the epidemic at the time. 
uh, important things were happening from a number of community agencies. So in 2016, a multidisciplinary team was brought together representing the local public health unit, aid services organizations, housing services, indigenous groups, addiction specialists, HIV care providers, um, a local um, uh, community health center, and, uh, and the St. Joseph's Hospital-based HIV clinic. Uh, it involved team-based care, so regular meetings to discuss cases, folks focusing on establishment of housing and linkages to services. The health unit also sponsored outreach campaigns to help patients attend their HIV clinic appointments, and that actually continued through COVID, where they were, where, where, where it, it was through telemedicine and the healthcare work, the um, uh, the, uh, the public health would take patients, uh, would go to patients and bring them a phone. Um, and the supervised overdose prevention site was open in London in February 2018, which was also important. And to see what happened with the epidemic, so we peaked in 2016. In July of 2017, we brought in this control, and if I show monthly data, there was a rapid fall in, 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 in new incident cases in HIV shortly thereafter. 2017 fell, and it's continued to stay. Uh, we've continued to stay. This we suspect uh, at, at around the provincial average, we suspect 2020 was due to reduced testing um, happening at that time due to COVID. So basically, this was a, a community ca campaign that involved Cook Your Wash, but also involved multiple other uh, things by multiple uh, service organizations from London Cares for Housing and Regional HIV AIDS Connection and the Middlesex uh, um, uh, London Health Unit. And we got funding from Ontario HIV Treatment Network. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Silverman. Um, that is an amazing success story, uh, one that I always enjoy um, hearing about. If you have questions for Dr. Silverman, I'll ask you to please put them in the portal chat. I'm monitoring the portal chat and I will pick up those questions at the end. Um, but just sort of in the interest in keeping time, Dr. Silverman will move on to the next presenter in this session. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Dr. Bill O'Leary, an assistant professor from Wilfrid Laurier University, who's going to be presenting the abstract entitled Beyond My Scope, providing hospital-based healthcare services for people living with HIV who use drugs. Mute, <laughs> see him strikes again. Unfortunately, we still can't hear you. I'm thinking you can hear me now. We can hear you now, yes. Just we lost your slides. Brilliant, thank you so much. And you can see just the presentation slide then? Mm-hmm, perfect. Awesome. Michael, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, hi everyone, my name is Bill O'Leary. I'm excited to meet with you today. I'm joining you from my home, which is on Treaty 13 land, and that's commonly called Toronto. So this is the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And as Jessica said, the title of my talk is Beyond My Scope, Providing Hospital-Based Healthcare Services for People Living with HIV Who Use Drugs. And just a quick clarification that in a hospital environment, when a healthcare provider is asked to become engaged in providing care, but if they feel they aren't appropriately trained to do so, the phrase beyond my scope, it's commonly offered. So, the research rationale. So, the why. So in Canada, approximately 12% of hospital presentations are related to drug use and people living with HIV who use drugs, they're hospitalized at higher rates than the general population. And barriers to receiving and providing equitable hospital care, that's driven by all the interactions of the people in the hospital. So analysis of the hospital admission experience can offer insight into the care that's being provided. And that understanding can then be used to improve the hospital admission experience of equity seeking communities. And just uh, in terms of this presentation, drug use, as it pertains to what I'll talk about today, that's the consumption of drugs from unregulated sources. So just a clarification there as well. In terms of some background, uh, over 62,000 people are living with HIV in Canada. Now I'm using data from 2018 as opposed to 2020, 
And in the q and I'm happy to tell you why I chose to do that. In 2018, 2,561 HIV diagnoses were reported to Public Health Agency of Canada. 21% of those reported cases were linked to injection drug use. And I also want to point out that if you look to the side, Indigenous people represent 20% of those reported cases, yet Indigenous people account for under 5% of the Canadian population. And to the next point on the slide, beyond the injection drug use, it's important to consider like there's disinhibiting effects of smoking or snorting, snorting drugs in terms of the influencers of HIV transmission. And overall, consider that drug use is linked to adverse health behaviors and some outcomes. So that would be uh, suboptimal HIV treatment, poor immune suppression, HIV replication, and mortality. So the research questions to better understand hospital care as it, as it relates to people living with HIV who use drugs, two questions I put forward. How do implicit and explicit actions occurring in a hospital environment construct the hospitalization experience of people living with HIV who use drugs? And what are the institutional rules that dictate the actions of the individual during a hospital admission? In terms of the theoretical framework I'm using, I'm using structuration theory. Now that's prominently applied in sociology. So structuration posits that structure and agency are mutually constituted. So one can't exist without the other. Structures produce action and actions in turn produce the structure. So people would say, why that framework? So after years of providing training on direct practice approaches, I came to realize a person isn't likely to apply a technique if it's in conflict with their unconscious beliefs. So understanding our beliefs becomes a priority. So structuration provides this concept of practical knowledge. Our practical knowledge is comprised of unconscious beliefs and these beliefs guide our actions. So, in a qualitative descriptive study titled Clinician Perspectives on Reducing Discharges Against Medical Advice for Substance Using Patients Living with HIV and Hepatitis C, we engaged healthcare providers, so physicians, nurses, dietitian, pharmacists, and social workers who were working in acute care hospitals in Ottawa and Toronto and who delivered care to people living with HIV who use drugs during their admission. We did 26 semi-structured interviews and also brief questionnaires all were completed. Thematic analysis was conducted. We specifically use Braun and Clark's six phase approach. Uh, and that's, we're using thematic analysis as a way to identify and analyze like there's relevant patterns there in meeting. And you're looking at using explicit content as a way to identify the implicit content. So in this data that we're analyzing, it's filled with the practical knowledge of healthcare providers. So first thing we wanna consider are rules guide actions. So healthcare providers reported they weren't aware of any explicit hospital rules that support their practice when providing care to people living with HIV who use drugs. However, they report regularly encountering drug use behaviors that were unacceptable to them and that they actually felt warranted discharge. So in the absence of explicit hospital rules, healthcare providers applied implicit rules that were more in line with their practical knowledge, their beliefs. So for example, uh, multiple healthcare providers in Ottawa, they told us that if a person left the hospital for 24 hours, they're discharged. No such rule exists. So where does that come from? We had a pharmacist in Toronto tell us this. If there was a fall, we have a falls team. There's a protocol for managing falls, that sort of thing. But if someone just went out, smoked crack, came back in, and we knew that they did that, I'm not sure if there's a protocol. Another consideration is that agency and action have an interplay with one another. So healthcare providers constructed and perpetuated a difficult patient identity. So an outcome of this difficult patient identity is the limiting of the agency of the person that is being applied to. So the identity starts to negate, it actually negates the many intersecting identities that that person carries with them. So this single category identity of difficult patient, it's freeing the healthcare provider from having to consider how their beliefs about race, class, gender, sexuality, how they're informing their actions. And many healthcare providers held a belief that a carceral hospital environment would result in positive outcomes for people living with HIV who use drugs. So this carceral ideology is linked to the healthcare provider's practical knowledge, their belief that treatment outcomes would improve through the removal of liberties. So a nurse in Ottawa had this to say, 
they would leave the unit for a couple of hours and come back. And the nurse would report the next morning that patient came back, looked groggy, looked confused, agitated. So we told the patient, this is not acceptable in the hospital. Now you're aware. Next time this happens, we're going to test you for drugs. And if it's positive, you'll be discharged on the spot. Another consideration is that these actions are in fact constructing the admission experience. So in the hospital environment, dominant subordinate positions are maintaining the actions that are occurring. And these actions construct this admission experience. So for example, most healthcare providers believe that drug use should stop. And this is a guiding belief that drives their clinical practice during the hospital admission. And an important consideration is that the actions that are reinforcing this difficult patient identity, this then removes accountability of the healthcare providers to reduce stigma and promote health equity. So a key learning on the influence of action uh, comes when we consider historical HIV experiences. So again, looking at like the 1980s and the early 1990s, many people living with HIV identified that their HIV was in fact a barrier for interpersonally connecting with healthcare providers. So at the time, HIV created this physical distance between the person and the healthcare provider. Participants in this study are highlighting that there's stigma and the stigma um, with drug use creates a mental and emotional distancing with people living with HIV who use drugs. So we had a physician in Ottawa say this, so it's not your average and forgive me for being blunt about it, high functioning professional, you know, doctor, dentist, lawyer, researcher who is addicted to drugs. So when they come in, they are usually meant, there's usually mental health issues, personality disorders, psychosis that make it challenging to provide care to them. Some thoughts. So actions that are occurring during the hospitalization, they privilege some and not others. And these actions will continue to dictate the hospital admission experience. The healthcare providers practical knowledge, their beliefs, establish a foundation for the implicit rules that are gonna be applied. And many healthcare providers taking part in this study, they also identified there's deficits in their training that impact their clinical practice as it relates to a drug using population. So now we include to this their difficult patient beliefs. So is providing hospital care to people living with HIV who use drugs beyond the scope of all these healthcare providers? A limitation I want to raise for this study is that, or for what I'm presenting today is that participants in this study, are taking, they're working in large urban hospitals and healthcare providers working in these hospitals have far more access to resources when you compare that to healthcare providers working in rural or northern communities. So that's one limitation I want to raise. Um, implications for clinical practice and training. So on a micro level, let's provide clinicians with training and supervision so they can stand in a self-critical position and then they can deconstruct their beliefs and recognize how power is exercised through actions that are being guided by these beliefs. On a meso level, let's ask community-based organizations to bring targeted interventions into the hospitals so we can call out stigma of drug use and the othering of people who use drugs. And on a macro level, policies and training that explicitly include equity strategies, these are for people who use drugs protection against discrimination. So policy can also lead to accountability. And to provide equitable health services, it's imperative that clinicians distinguish how their role and its related actions impact the experience of equity-seeking communities, such as people living with HIV who use drugs. And as I wrap up, I just wanted to take a brief moment. I want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Carol Strike and Dr. David Brennan for their mentorship. I also want to uh, send a big thank you out to the research team for their ongoing support. Um, have a lovely day, everyone. I look forward to chatting with you. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Leary. That was an amazing talk. Um, it was really eye-opening for me as someone who is um, a basic scientist and working frequently one step away from care delivery and especially a point of contact. Um, a lot, a lot for someone, um, someone like me to, to, to really think about and um, absorb, uh, really powerful. Do we, um, do we have any questions from the audience? You can put them into your, your chat window. I know we have a lot of attendees and these have been some excellent talks, but our audience, our audience seems very shy in this session. 
maybe maybe um maybe <laughs> overwhelmed by some of those quotes um as as i was um so we're actually still running just a tiny bit behind time so i am i am going to move on then in the sake of time thank you so much um dr o'leary it was an amazing talk so our next um, and our last speaker in the panel today um, is Dr. Kathleen Deering, who's an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. And they're going to be presenting um, with Prina Thacker, who's graduate research assistant. Um, and the title of their abstract is COVID-19, Associated Public Health Responses and Gaps in Remote Virtual Care Among Women Living with HIV a mixed method study. Thank you so much. So, and so actually just in clarification, I was meant to present today uh, with Melanie Lee. And unfortunately I just heard now that she hasn't been able to join as presenter for this session. So I will do the best I can with her pieces. So sorry, Melanie, um, we will do this again another time. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much. So I just want to start off uh, by acknowledging that the land that we do most of our work on is the unceded, stolen, and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. So in terms of a bit of background to this study, uh, so we've seen throughout the COVID pandemic that women living with HIV have um, experienced, there's been some research showing that women living with HIV have experienced barriers to a number of different social determinants of health and health and health access inequities. Uh, they continue to face many barriers both before COVID and during COVID. The COVID pandemic and the associated public responses um, have exacerbated health and social inequities among sexual minority women, gender minority women, indigenous women and immigrant women and racialized women. And um, all of these women are overrepresented in our study as well. So the objective of this study was to try and understand how the COVID pandemic and the associated public health responses have shaped women's experiences in accessing healthcare services. So data from this study was drawn from Shauna, the Shauna Project, which is a community-based longitudinal cohort study that was initiated in 2014-2015 after extensive consultation by community and clinical collaborators, as well as women living with HIV. There's been an amazing qualitative and arts-based research program led by Dr. Andrea Crusi, and I lead the quantitative cohort. The cohort includes a baseline interview with follow-up interviews every six months with women living with HIV who are 14 years of age or older and who identify as cis or trans women, as well as are living in or accessing care in Metro Vancouver. As part of the study, we offer voluntary STI testing and PAP testing and collect data on HIV viral load and CD4. The funding for the study is provided by NIH, uh, CHR, and CTN. So we drew on both qualitative and quantitative data for this study. So for the quantitative piece, we drew on responses by 166 participants to a COVID-19 supplement survey that was introduced in about May of 2020 and collected information on experiences since the pandemic began. For the qualitative piece, we drew on 28 semi-structured interviews with women living with HIV between May and July 2020, so pretty early in the pandemic. We used a socio-ecological framework to understand experiences of women accessing healthcare during COVID-19. So this slide shows the prevalence of some key markers of access to addictions and harm reduction services experienced by women in our study. Overall, 82 women who of the 166 who responded to that COVID supplement reported using injection or non-injection drugs since COVID-19 started. And of those 84% reported some changes to their drug use, which included using more or less, relapsing, changes to the quality of the drugs they used, among other changes. Almost 30% reported that they did have some access to safe supply of those, uh, and of those who reported they could use, oh, this was of those who reported that they could use or that safe supply was relevant to them, with only 6% reporting improved access to safe supply. 
Almost a quarter of participants reported reduced access to harm reduction supplies and 11% reported reduced access to drug and addiction treatment. This slide shows that almost half of participants reported increased difficulty accessing routine healthcare with a little over a quarter of participants reporting increased difficulties accessing HIV care. Some women in the study had increased difficulty accessing art, but some actually had improved access to art. So I'll read several key themes from participant narratives that describe how COVID-19 shaped access to health services. So first, among participant narratives, some women described that the shift to remote or virtual care and appointments was convenient and did alleviate uh, some fear of exposure to COVID, while others described that their access to medications was increased due to shifts in policies. So this quote says, if I'm not gonna be doing any kind of procedures or tests, like I live in Delta, you know, you're like five hours just doing that. If it's non-procedure, Zoom is great. Women's narratives, further reflected that the shift to remote and virtual care had a substantial impact on rapport with providers, um, as well as continuity of care and interprofessional care. Um, and this could include, for example, HIV related blood work or mammograms. And this resulted in delays to accessing services, even in the context of this increased safety. So one woman said, I can't get my blood work done though, because nothing's open. I'm starting to get really pissed off about all of this. I haven't even seen my doctor. They made it like a blanket, give her pills until this is over, right? Well, yeah, I had talked to the doctor for all of five minutes, but the thing is like, if I can't get my blood work done, it's a moot point, right? Women also reported experiences of drug use stigma and discrimination, which um, are commonly reported as a barrier to accessing pain medications. And this was also further complicated complicated by the shift to remote and virtual care, and in some cases, difficulties in doing in-person exams. Uh, this participant says, because of, you know, dealing with an opioid crisis, yeah, just to get something like T3s for the pain, you know, you basically have to be almost dying to get it. They'll give you 20 tablets that's supposed to last you a month, you know, and I have to go in every month to get it refilled, which is hard with COVID, right? So like many research studies and organizations, COVID and the associated public health responses had an impact on who we were able to connect with. So we're a longitudinal study. We typically see people pretty regularly. We work hard to connect with participants and have a lot of staff time devoted to outreach and follow-up. Um, <clears throat> but during COVID, we switched back and forth from remote to in-person work with long stretches doing remote work. And we found that on average, we had about a 25% loss in terms of the number of follow-ups that we were able to do compared to before COVID. We did a bit more analysis on who we were less likely to see and who we were missing during these follow-up periods um, when COVID was, after COVID had started. And so we found that during COVID, we were less likely to see participants who at their most recent pre-COVID interview were indigenous and or otherwise racialized versus white, sexual minority versus straight, gender minority versus cis, and we are also le less likely to see participants who had lived in the downtown east side uh, pre-COVID, who used non-injection and injection drugs, who experienced interpersonal or gender-based violence, and who are not on art. So this really paints a picture of us missing um, some of the more marginalized um, members of our cohort, including those who had reduced access to technology and who were disconnected from care. These results may also provide some insights into who could have had greater barriers to accessing other forms of remote healthcare during COVID. So we'll just close and say that our findings provide some insight into some of the barriers and challenges that women living with HIV may experience in accessing healthcare. In terms of an action plan, we would recommend that women living with HIV have options for both remote and in-person healthcare and HIV care and addictions care as well, and advocate for virtual and remote hubs created, particularly in areas like the downtown east side, to improve access to care for more marginalized women. These spaces should always be culturally safe and trauma-informed. We also recommend low barrier trauma-informed and harm reduction primary care and pain services to support access to pain medications for women living with HIV, especially during the ongoing drug poisoning toxicity epidemic. This is particularly important for us as over half of women in our largest study report managing their pain with criminalized substances. So thank you so much um, to all the participants, staff and community partners in our projects and to all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deering, for that, um, that beautiful abstract. 
Um, if you have any questions, there's lots of attendees here, please put your questions in the chat. Um, I have uh, one initial question. We were interested in examining um, access to ARTs in Uganda during COVID. <laughs> And one of the um, one of the ways that we wanted to look at this was if there was a rise in the existence or transmission of um, drug resistant strains of HIV. I'm curious if you know if anyone is um, performing similar studies in um, um, in Vancouver or um, in Canada in general. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. I'm afraid I don't actually know. It, it's not a part of our study. And so, um, yeah, I can't really direct you towards that, but hopefully someone is. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions for the first um, presenter, uh, um, Dr. baltzer Turji. So thank you very much. If you have any questions for Dr. Deering, please put them in the chat. We can come back. But I just, um, since we have three minutes before the end of the session, I'm, I'm happy that we can roll back and get back to those. Um, so one, one of the questions was also about evidence of diversion um, in your study as well. And then the other one um, was are asking about expanding on nursing or physician resources that were needed. I was also very questioned about that. Is there a nurse on site? Or if you have um, any idea of how many um, overdoses are handled per week, transfers to hospital, et cetera. Yep, so we do not have a pharmacist on site. All medications are handled by RNs. There are four RNs on site, but remember that we're offering multiple services here. Uh, so the the IOPS uh, services are just are just one component of it. So uh, what we have is a courier system that all, all medications are the diacetylmorphine as well as the hydromorphone, and um, there's uh, some meds that uh, like a metadol D or something like that will be delivered in the morning, and that will be a courier from the pharmacy. Uh, nurses will check that medication in. Um, all medications, like I said, are administered by the nurses. Um, I will say that for diversion, um, we've only really noticed um, through pill forms uh, because initially before COVID, everything, especially uh, medication like Cadian, everything was um, you know taken out of the capsule, you know, mixed with uh, you, know, you had to, you basically had to everything had to be taken in front of the nurse. But once uh, COVID came in. They, the rules changed and basically it was to get people in and out as fast as possible. So even wait times um, after, once somebody becomes stabilized on the diacetylmorphine or the hydromorphone, they did not have to wait that long. People would get them out as quickly as possible. They were allowed carries at that time um, of ADN, um, even uh, like Metadol D. Um, that has been restricted a little bit more as, uh, as the basically the rules changed as COVID changed within our community. Um, as for, you do have to be careful. We do have a set, we try to make the, the room itself um, less medical, but we still the use of mirrors um, to help the person, but also help us have a clear view, even if they're not in direct view of us. Uh, and because we're a smaller um, institution in the sense that, we don't have, you know, say 10 people in an environment at once. We now only have it down to three. I mean, you can watch, even if somebody's turn, you can, through a mirror, you can definitely see, I've only had it once where somebody I think did switch the, you know, well, they did switch the needle and uh, you have to be careful of that, but that gets a full discussion with the staff and, and uh, I haven't had any issues then. You have to watch more of the, the the pill diversion part, but I, to, over time, there's a lot of trust issues that we have set up and through uh, UDSs uh, once a month, um, we really try to make those a safety uh, monitoring where we're really trying to talk to the people about the danger of benzos and um, really try to focus as not a punishment. We want them to be clear about what they're using um, and what the dangers are with that illegal drug use. We find that pat, like fentanyl patches will get away from uh, some of the diversion issues, even though you have to be careful 
uh, when collecting it to make sure that they haven't taken one off. But again, we'll get into a conversation with somebody if they did. I mean, I just anecdotally one, you know, he did, he said I had to try once. It was like, okay, fair enough, but don't do it again. Um, so uh, we try to have, so it's a clear conversation. And because we're very, we have a lot of these conversations that more time to talk to people, we have not had any overdoses in the three years that we've had this program. So we have not sent anybody to a hospital. That being said, we do pre and post assessments. These And we will hold the medication so they will not get it. We will get a, if we feel that another UDS is to be completed because we're worried about benzos, we'll do that at that time. We'll also get a consult from the doctor. The cost of this is our doctor is actually very nice to us. <laughs> so there is a lot of where she is available uh, more than probably than she should be. But a nurse practitioner is also available um, when, when that doctor is not available. And we do that seven days a week. So um, because I think of the the conversation that we have, and the I mean, it's true that these are we're not naive to say that you know somebody could be really um, <laughs> good at diverting, but we're trying to have conversations. And I will say, we over time, a lot of people started out with the IV um, as the you as their primary way of delivering the drugs, but. Um, I tell you, it's a lot of work coming to a place and, and using IV drugs. And we find most of the, the 90, or I'd say 85% of the people go to IM injections. Um, these can be assisted also by the nurse because we found that the uh, people were injecting to the same site and that can cause infections. We actually had some. So when we actually know that the, the benefit of a nurse assisting with an IM injection is that you know the medications have been delivered. That being said, we just, it, it is uh, monitoring with a smaller number number of people. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in that question there. Um, yeah, I think they got everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of your your knowledge with us and your experiences with the, the program. It sounds like um, an incredible program. And thank you very much to all of our presenters today. Um, this is the conclusion of our key population session on people who use drugs. So big round of a hand uh, applause. I wish that um, we could uh, you know, be there to clap for you all in person, but thank you very, very much for your talks today um, and enjoy the rest of your car.